Hello everyone, I'm Beth Mascheski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. You can download the slides to this presentation in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. The recording and slides will be available usually about a week after the presentation concludes. I'll be sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. For this webinar, everyone will remain muted. You can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll be reading those to the speaker at the end. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker. James Carter is the Program and Operations Manager for the Ann Arbor Summer Festival, and he goes by JD. The Ann Arbor Summer Festival is typically shortened to A2SF. JD splits his time between programming for A2SF and managing staff during that season, and he's led the initiative to transform A2SF into a zero waste event. JD has 19 years of experience curating and producing performing arts and visual arts, and he's co-founded the Manhattan-based theater company, Terra Nova Collective, which presented world-class performers in its Sola Nova Arts Festival. So JD, thanks for joining us and the webinar is yours. Thanks Beth. Uh, thanks to everyone who is here today. I really appreciate you being here and we're excited to share a little bit about what we've been doing at the Ann Arbor Summer Festival over the past two seasons um, to become a, a zero waste event. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just gonna kick things off here with a little uh, video uh, about the Summer Festival. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into what I'd like to share with you today. So that is a snapshot or a video of uh, the Summer Festival and here in Ann Arbor. And uh, we, uh, there we go. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a little bit so that you can see what the festival looks like and contextualize things as we uh, move through the presentation. Um, you know, uh, over the last two years uh, at the Ann Arbor Summer Festival, uh, we have started the Zero Waste Initiative and we've implemented a uh, really uh, dramatic waste management transformation. Uh, and just wanted to share you a little bit about uh, that. Also, um, uh, there are a few links in uh, the PDF that Beth uh, sent through. So uh, as we go through that, I'll, I'll note those things. Um, so the, the Summer Festival began in 1984 uh, as a partnership between the University of Michigan and the city, uh, because in June and July, uh, the city empties out and there's not a lot of people here except for some summer school. Uh, there's not a lot of students here except for some summer uh, school students. And so uh, what ended up happening was uh, it became a, a 21 day gathering uh, on a beautiful campus green uh, and indoor, indoor venues um, in June and July. And so uh, about six or eight of our shows every year are uh, ticketed indoor performances. Uh, and then the rest of our festival, uh, which is about 90%, uh, 96% uh, of our activities, 
uh, are outdoor and they're free. And as you saw, uh, we have concerts, uh, we have outdoor uh, films, we have giant spectacle performances, uh, lots of family entertainment. Uh, there's a, a tent called the Annex, and in the Annex, we do a lot of special programming, uh, community programming, and then presentation of artists um, that do like installations or, or performances in there as well. Um, the community sees um, the summer festival as a bridge between the city and the university, and that's how uh, both of those entities kind of view us. And so we get varying amount of support from um, either entity um, on any given year, um, mostly uh, over a period of about three years, um, we re receive a certain amount of financial support from each one of those entities every year. Um, but as we go through this, uh, you'll see a little bit more about how those uh, relationships have grown uh, just in the last two years. Uh, so in 2018, Toyota, uh, which is one of our bigger sponsors, uh, approached us uh, with the challenge to become a zero waste event. And basically the way that they approached us was they had been working with us for about 11 years uh, on another series called our Global Music Series. And uh, that had been super successful in which we were bringing in uh, different um, musicians from around the globe. And those artists uh, are, have now become part of our DNA. We, we present global music uh, every year now. And uh, Toyota um, had sort of made this transition to um, doing a lot more with social impact. And they had several different plag planks that they presented to us in 2018. And of the different planks that they uh, were offering uh, to say, hey, you know, what if, uh, what if you focused on this? Uh, the zero waste challenge became really sort of like the, the most important to us, uh, mainly because we had already started doing a little bit in that world. Uh, we had been looking at the challenge of that. Uh, we had uh, implemented um, compostable beer cups and uh, we were trying to uh, figure out a way to transition the rest of our operations over. And it had been really challenging because um, I don't know how many of you have had to do anything like this, but you know, there's a certain amount of cost, there's a certain amount of um, time and energy and uh, resources that are needed to make that happen. Plus, um, you know, you're trying to make some shifts uh, with, with food vendors and with caterers and all of those types of things. Um, it, it can it can be a lot. So uh, we we said okay, we really want to do this. And they said okay, that's great, um, but it must make a significant social impact here in Washtenaw County, which is where Ann Arbor um, exists, uh, and hopefully beyond. And uh, we said okay, well that's really great because we've also been talking about how we as an organization can better make a social impact with the work that we're doing. Uh, we felt like we were uniquely. Uh, positioned to do this uh, because not only are we uh, sort of a partnership between the university and the city, um, but we are a 36-year-old organization, or at least at the time we were a 35-year-old organization, um, that the the townies especially uh, really just love and appreciate. It's it's a, a tradition that happens every summer, and after the cold Michigan winters, people come out and they're ready to uh, to connect and. Uh, get with the community and uh, and we knew that if we could uh, take this on that we'd be positioned to work with a lot of different organizations in the county uh, to implement uh, our, our transformation. So um, one thing that happened in 2018 that we were really excited about was uh, that we had a, what we call a long table discussion and now a long table discussion is a performative uh, dinner table style conversation around a civic uh, topic. And the civic uh, topic that, of course, we chose was becoming a zero waste event. And in this annex uh, location that I mentioned earlier, um, we had about 40 people show up uh, to discuss uh, the idea of becoming a zero waste event, what that entails and how we might go about it. We got a lot of great ideas that day, um, but even more importantly, we were able to um, call from that day, uh, I think there was at least four or five people who attended that event that ended up joining uh, what we called our Festival Footprint Brain Trust. Uh, the Fo Festival Footprint Brain Trust um, was an advisory committee uh, that was made up of uh, leaders from the city, the county, the university. Um, there was a, an entity uh, in Toyota called um, Terra, T-E-R-R-A, and uh, there it's like 
uh, Toyota's um, uh, sustainability uh, or, uh, group within Toyota and uh, the citizens of Ann Arbor uh, and beyond. Uh, so we had a mom and a teen uh, join us and uh, be on it because we really felt like we wanted to get lots of di different experts from lots of different uh, aspects of uh, uh, society. So uh, it was it was really great. What, what it did for us was it laid the groundwork uh, for media outreach and uh, it acted as uh, advisors in the creation of grant proposals and marketing language. Um, but I think that the, the greatest thing that it did for us was it gave us a window into all of their worlds and uh, allowed us to sort of understand better how to position this. Um, Ann Arbor is a relatively progressive city. It's a university town and uh, there's a lot of uh, people who want to get behind uh, these issues. but um, we still knew that there was going to be uh, some friction, and we wanted to find ways to best uh, speak to uh, different groups of uh, of uh, the the community. Uh, I think that the key thing that came from this, and and I kind of feel like if there's one takeaway from this entire presentation, uh, so this is the moment that you all write it down. Um, is uh, get your buy-in from local leaders and organizations. Um, if you can get your city, if you can get your county, and if you're located um, near uh, an educational uh, center like a university, um, if you can get buy-in from those, um, those entities, then you're more likely to get support and potentially down the road uh, get uh, financial uh, support. Um, uh, we, we still to this day get uh, a lot of emails from the county uh, saying, hey, the state has got this uh, type of grant coming up right now. Um, and, you know, every once in a while I'll get an email from one of our brain trust uh, members and they'll say, oh, hey, I just want to let you know this is happening here. If you wanted to try and incorporate it into the festival or, or uh, try to uh, leverage it for funding, uh, this could be a good opportunity for you. So still to this day, um, about a year and a half later, we're, we're connected to these uh, people and it's, it's been a super important part of the implementation of our transformation. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about our operational achievements that we had in 2019. Uh, one was that we implemented uh, three stream waste bins and uh, we reduced our upstream waste creation and downstream landfill by implementing these uh, receptacles um, and we had staff and volunteers guide patrons uh, throughout the site. So our festival is 21 days and uh, 21 nights rather. And uh, we had volunteers at each location uh, telling people where to go. And we, we also had, um, as you can see in this uh, photograph, uh, images of what you could recycle um, and what you could compost. And this photograph specifically was taken earlier in the festival, I'll tell you, because um, as we went through the festival, we pivoted uh, and those signs all changed uh, to actually show images of things that were um, uh, landfill um, because some of our food vendors uh, weren't completely compliant and we had to uh, take photographs of those things and put it onto the landfill and then um, people knew that what they had purchased potentially at the, um, at the food vendor was not compostable or recyclable. Uh, these receptacles were purchased in part uh, with a sponsorship from uh, Washtenaw County, uh, which was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of our great partnerships that came out of uh, the Brain Trust, and uh, we really were, were thankful for that. So uh, Toyota gave us uh, this baseline, but then uh, Washtenaw County uh, supported us in sort of the next uh, evolution of what we needed to do. Um, and so uh, as a result of all this in 2018, uh, our rate of diversion uh, was 61.3%, um, uh, and that was the very first year that we sort of announced what we were doing. And we used 2018 as an announcement year. It wasn't really a year in which we were implementing things because Toyota approached us in the, uh, in the spring of 2018, right before our festival started. So we didn't have enough runway to like, do a great big implementation and transformation. And in the end, having our brain trust uh, work with us into the fall of 2018 into the spring of 2019 
really helped because then we were able to do all the things that we really wanted to do. And we ended up jumping uh, from 61% uh, to an 81.4% uh, increase in our uh, compost removal by, uh, by 10 tons. Uh, so we, we did more than 20 from one year to the next. Um, and one of our other operational achievements uh, and another big partner that we have uh, with us, of course, is the city of Ann Arbor. And the city of Ann Arbor uh, provided two water stations. Uh, and this was to do two things. One, uh, it was um, to provide free water for people and uh, um, you know, encourage people to bring their own vessels uh, to the summer festival. And then the other thing, of course, um, that we wanted it to do was reduce our plastic bottle usage. Um, we provided uh, 400 reusable stainless steel water bottles that the city also donated to us. Uh, and they, they gave those on the provision that we donate them to the community. Uh, so what we did was we have about uh, 80 uh, staff members that are on site every year. And we gave each one of them a, a water bottle. And traditionally, historically, we have um, given water bottles to uh, oh, when I say given water bottles, traditionally we have let the employees just go into the coolers and grab plastic water bottles um, uh, from the, the coolers. And we said to them this last year, uh, here's your water bottle and you are only able to get water from these fountains. Uh, so as a result, we ended up seeing uh, our plastic bottle usage reduction uh, by almost 4,000. Uh, which, you know, personally, I was actually very surprised about it. We, we knew that it would obviously reduce, um, but didn't figure that it would reduce by this much. And, you know, these water fountains that you see pictured up here uh, in the upper right-hand corner, um, there was two of them. One, one looked more like a traditional water fountain, and the, this one was a little bit more of a, uh, you know, a, a piping structure. Um, but it had a, a physical drinking fountain. So people would just go up to it and take a drink out of it and then walk away, you know. So instead of um, necessarily, you know, needing a full bottle of water, they would just take what they needed and, and move on. So um, that was exciting. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more, click on the link uh, there in the PDF uh, to take you to A2H2O and understand what they're doing um, uh, in the city of Ann Arbor. Um, so some other operational achievements that we uh, did in 2019 was we hired a festival footprint administrative assistant. And this person was actually one of our former interns uh, from 2018. And she had worked with us on some of our sort of launching of things in 2018. And her job was essentially to um, do outreach on volunteerism and reach uh, different organizations and groups that were uh, that are in the education system or in uh, scouting or uh, or places like that and once uh, we brought on our, our seasonal staff we hired a, a dedicated on-site zero waste assistant manager and that meant that this uh, person was on site uh, every day and all the work that the administrative assistant had done um, she transferred over to uh, an intern who uh, worked with our uh, assistant manager on site to um, set up all of the volunteers each night and also make sure that the volunteer trainings happened on site. Uh, so this assistant manager had a team of three. Uh, those team members would be managing the volunteer teams that would go out and they would guide people to each one of the different locations. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that happened, uh, as I sort of already mentioned in 2019 uh, rather, uh, is that we were able to leverage uh, Toyota's support uh, to bring on an increased uh, program fund. So Washtenaw County, uh, DTA Energy, which is the big electric company here uh, in Southeast Michigan, um, the foundation there, uh, the city of Ann Arbor uh, has come on uh, this season to uh, support a uh, portion of our uh, festival, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the University of Michigan um, Office of Campus Sustainability, uh, uh, you know, I can't sort of shout them out more um, because in essence they took on a lot of because we are uh, university affiliated they took on a lot of our uh, costs for um, uh, trash removal and they gave us all of our composting bags 
and uh, took took on those costs as well. So um, it was really sort of helpful in the way that we would work toward uh, managing these increased in costs uh, going forward. So uh, it, it was pretty uh, wonderful, uh, the relationship that we've uh, started with all of these groups uh, as a result of sort of just this baseline seed money that we got from Toyota. Uh, so we're a performing arts presenter. Uh, that's what we do. And we, we felt like we would be remiss if we didn't um, do something that was reflecting uh, these values. This, these, you know, just didn't want to change our operations. We wanted to actually make an impact through our programming. Uh, so in 2018, when we made our big announcement, um, yet to make a giant transformation, uh, we brought in uh, Detroit-based artist uh, Juan Martinez's um, kinetic sculptures, uh, and he also uh, did a workshop of um, making art from recycled materials. Uh, so this is Juan on one of his uh, kinetic sculptures. Uh, there was three of them, and each one of them is a different animal that's an endangered species. And then uh, uh, the the frame, the bike frame that uh, all of these animals are on, are all made from repurposed bikes. Uh, so uh, it's it's partly uh, working with recycled materials, and then it's also partly uh, working uh, to raise awareness about uh, wildlife in the, in the world. Uh, he's a really great artist and, and a great guy, and so it was wonderful to have him come through the first year. And then our second year, uh, we had a woman um, artist uh, from a, a Brooklyn Breaks artist, um, Mary Maddenley, uh, who led a four-day large-scale public arts uh, co-creation of her installation called Objects in the Round. And Objects in the Round, as you'll see, uh, is uh, this big sculpture that, uh, that grew over four days um, by people bringing in different objects from their houses um, that they wanted to don donate essentially to to the sculpture that was getting created. Um, but in addition to that, um, she uh, built in uh, a lot of uh, art creation on site. So if you had a piece that you donated or you brought to be a part of the sculpture, uh, then you could draw a picture of it or you could write a story about it and then she would hang those up in the perimeters. And so it was about our relationship to objects and a relationship to where they go and how we relate to them. And the thing that was was really exciting about it for us was that um, it became a co-presentation um, with the University of Michigan Museum of Art, or UMA, uh, where Mattingly's photography was featured in a, a group exhibition called The World to Come, Art in the Age of Anthropocene. And that was a, a traveling, um, a traveling uh, group show that happened last year uh, in different locations. So I, I recommend you, you take a look into that. It's called The World to Come, Art in the Age of Anthropocene. Uh, and there's just some really wonderful pieces that were part of that. And uh, so we uh, worked with uh, the University of Michigan uh, to, um, to do a uh, long table discussion around art and social impact and what that means to make uh, social impact with art. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do, of course, with this was make an educational uh, impact. Uh, so in 2019, this last year, we established the Festival Footprint Learning Center. And the Learning Center uh, was up for all 21 nights of our festival. And uh, the festival, uh, sorry, the, the participants that were in there brought in different activities each night. And those activities were uh, as much as possible interactive uh, and educational. Um, and it wasn't geared just towards uh, children either. It was a real um, suggestion of how can you take these uh, tenants home with you? How can you uh, be more sustainable in your own house? And so that was the sort of the challenge that we gave to each one of the groups and the entities that brought activities through is not only do you have to bring an activity through, but it has to be something that like, forces people to think about it in uh, a different way. And it wasn't all around recycling or composting. Um, some groups were um, bringing in things about energy efficiency. Um, Toyota, as you see there, they have uh, the Toyota Environmental Challenge 2050, and it's a big part of uh, where this all came from for us. Um, we're a very small portion of what they're trying to do um, over the next 50 years. And so they were able to educate the community on that and have some really fun interactive stuff. Um, so we, we were really pleased with how it went. Uh, the activities, um, there was 19 participants um, that brought in a different activity each night of the festival. So 
uh, and there's 21 nights. So we had a couple of groups who were like closer partners, like the city, the university, and the county come in for a couple of nights, uh, which was was really great to have them on site. So um, no big overhaul like this uh, would be complete without its challenges. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, of course, we want to talk about all of those things uh, and uh, let you know what we learned and, and where we want to come uh, go, go uh, going forward. I mentioned earlier that we have food vendors. We have 10 food vendors uh, and uh, we asked them to employ compostable uh, product materials so that people could, uh, you know, not be having as much landfill. And I, I would say that for the most part, uh, all of them made a, a great effort to do so. And uh, just like with us, there was a learning curve for our first year. For them, it was a learning curve for their first year. And, uh, you know, we had a group come in that uh, is part of a Recycle Ann Arbor and Zero Waste Washtenaw, uh, which is um, a portion of those uh, Washtenaw County and uh, Recycle Ann Arbor, which is a local organization that does all of our recycling here. Um, and educates people uh, and creates zero waste events. So for instance, there is a, a food truck rally that happens in the center of town every year, uh, once a month every summer. And they go in and they work with uh, the, the food truck rally um, to make the event a zero waste event. We knew that they couldn't come through for 21 nights. Um, so they came in and did all the training of our personnel and once they trained our personnel, we passed that training on to uh, the, our volunteers and the people who are working um, on our staff. And uh, the great thing was that Recycle Ann Arbor came through and Zero Waste Washington came through and they actually assessed all of our food vendors uh, kind of covertly, but they, they did it um, in about the, first, the end of the first week of the festival. And uh, we got a lot of great information and realized, you know, um, there was non-compostable things going out. There was things that were being said that they were compostable or rec recyclable, and there was problems with it. So, like, um, you know, things that might be recyclable still had like liquids in them when they were being thrown in, and so it wasn't being processed um, at the first point of entry uh, in, in the best way. And so uh, we went to our food vendors and we, you know, individually said. Hi, these are the things you've done well. These are the things that you didn't do well. And we would like to see if you could change those things before the end of the festival. And I would say that it, we had varying degrees of success with that. Um, some of them told us, you know, we are a franchise and we can't change our uh, product because of the branding that's on the cup or something like that. And we're waiting for the parent company to give us the go ahead on that. Um, and then by the next week, we found out that they got the go ahead and they changed everything over. So. Even midstream throughout the, the 21 days, we were able to pivot and change how we were working with our, our food vendors. And I mentioned this earlier, but the, the signs that were on the three streams also changed um, because then we were able to sort of have a, a, a greater understanding of, of how that would work. Um, what we've decided to do this year, um, well, I guess I'll talk about this in a second. Um, uh, one of the other things that was a big challenge is uh, caterers and party hosts. This is a world that we have a little less um, control over in the sense that uh, food vendors all sign contracts with us and we baked everything in with the, um, the products that they could use into our contract. And so if they're not using it, then we can decline to work with them. Um, caterers uh, are, are hired by our party hosts. So we have an area called our party tent and at the party tent, um, a different party comes through each night and uh, sometimes it's sponsors some, sometimes it's just people renting out the tent uh, to have a really great view of the main uh, music stage and uh, they'll bring in a caterer and we were like on opening night not opening night the second night of, of the festival the caterer came through and everything was like plastic forks and spoons and uh, we, we just so happened to have Toyota there that night it was just one of those coincidences that you sort of felt like a little bit embarrassed and, you know, fortunately, we have a really good relationship with um, that sponsor and they came up to us and they said, hey, listen, this is the thing. And we were like, wow, this is really unfortunate. And uh, and we worked with the caterer to try and change it up because a lot of times caterers come back. And I would say that a couple of weeks later into the festival, uh, I walked up and I picked up this really beautiful plate. It was like a dish, a serving dish, and it was 
most certainly compostable. And I said, I, I kind of uh, like turned it around and the caterer who was standing not too far from me, she was like, it's compostable. <laughs> she was very, very, I was like, yeah, I can tell. I said, I was actually just admiring it. It's really beautiful. And I think that, that if you're having troubles with caterers um, uh, being concerned about that, uh, you know, you can say one of two things. You can say one, well, you can bring China in. And I know that's something on your end that you have to then wash, but China is beautiful. But there is certainly a lot of products out there that, that look great and have really nice molds and you can um, implement. Uh, and so there's really not an argument. I think a lot of caterers just want to like go with the easy, cheap, low hanging fruit thing. Um, even food vendors want that sometimes, but that's sort of how we dealt with it. Um, and then the other thing was that we um, we made a concerted effort uh, to to uh, increase our volunteer pool. Uh, we had about 200 volunteers, and we needed to to increase our volunteers. So our volunteers traditionally have been greeters, and those greeters welcome people to the festival. They ask for donations on site, um, and these these um, volunteers that we were having come through for the Festival Footprint Zero Waste Initiative were guiding people uh, to all these different locations and we needed to increase our Festival Footprint volunteers by about 500, uh, which was, we knew a tall order going into it, but in actuality it didn't really increase nearly as much as we wanted it to. Um, so we did a lot of assessment after the festival. Um, one, we uh, brought in sort of a post-mortem uh, conversation uh, with some of our volunteers and some of the people who were assessing us uh, like from Zero Waste Wash and all and we had a big roundtable conversation about what worked and what didn't work uh, and uh, we ended up um, uh, doing a survey to our volunteers and asking them how things worked for them and as a result of that we made a big change in how we're going to be approaching volunteerism going forward uh, and that is that we're going to do video trainings uh, so that people aren't coming on the site. And if they are lay people who have never heard or understood any, I mean, they understand what composting is, they understand what recycling is, but they don't know what uh, you can and can't recycle because it's, it's a lot once you get into it. And you walk on a site, you're a lay person, and you're just given this, this training in like five minutes, and then you're just told to go out and tell people for two and a half hours how to um, move all of these things around to all these different bins, uh, it, it can be really overwhelming. So we're gonna do a training that's a video training and you get it ahead of time. And then when you show up on site, you'll get a refresher, um, but then people can come uh, prepared and they, if they have questions, they can just say, hey, uh, to our, our manager, uh, like I was watching this and that doesn't make sense. Can you explain that to me? Uh, and they can come really prepared and uh, and then go out and feel confident about it. Um, the, the thing that we, I think, learned as a result of it is that we also found out through our surveys that greeters um, didn't have a really good understanding of what they were supposed to do, uh, though it's a much lower sort of like bar as far as understanding or comprehension of how they're, they're supposed to approach people for donations or or, or whatnot. Uh, we we found that they were uh, their expectations uh, were not being met. Uh, so it's really transforming the way that we approach volunteerism. And our outreach for volunteers started in February of this year. Um, last year it started. Uh, I guess it was probably around April first or so. So we've gotten almost two full months of outreach um, ahead of where we are, were from last year. Uh, one thing I wanted to share, uh, and I'm not going to really go into it too much here, is that we got a little bit of press um, on the PDF. There's links to each one of these uh, these items, but uh, WEMU uh, has a show called Issues in the Environment, and their uh, Eastern uh, Michigan University's uh, radio station, a uh, really great radio station, and uh, one of our key media sponsors. Uh, they they also um, are one of the best jazz uh, stations in the nation. Uh, if you're interested in jazz, so we should check out WEMU, a little plug. Uh, and then uh, Concentrate, which is a, a local um, magazine, and then Waste360, which is a, a national magazine some of you might be familiar with. Uh, they, they all, um, th and this quote here uh, is from Waste360. So 
um, check out all those three things, uh, give you a little bit more context of uh, where we're at. And the, the Waste 360 article, I think, is really wonderful because it's uh, an article that features different festivals trying to do what we're doing, and they're all doing the same thing, but in different ways. So if you're eager to, to learn more about it, uh, I would go check out the Waste 360 uh, uh, link. So what are we doing over the future? So our target uh, is that we want to uh, become a 90% landfill diversion rate uh, in the next year. Uh, once we get to that point, that's like sort of the uh, uh, unspoken for saying that you're a zero waste event. Uh, we want to increase our volunteer numbers and work closely with our food vendors and caterers and reevaluate how we train them. And I already talked about all of those aspects. Um, we want to improve the learning center by including uh, more compelling and interactive activities. I'd say that we had probably about four or five uh, groups come through last year and they thought that they were supposed to be tabling and they just sat there with flyers and it wasn't very uh, exciting and interesting. So as a curator, as a, as a programming person, I want to, um, to make that better. And um, so the idea is that um, we had 19 organizations last year. We want to have 21 different organizations come through uh, when we do this next time, uh, to uh, to really you know make that space really more robust uh, and ingrain it as part of the DNA of uh, of what we do. Uh, we're planning on widening our fiscal in kind and partnership support, which is, I sort of already uh, went over how that that's been going, uh, and we want to continue measuring our impact and amplifying our efforts um, and trying to find more creative, actionable solutions uh, and reflecting the. Uh, Festival footprint values in our program. So, um, and then uh, we want to lead by example. Um, sort of one of the big reasons why I'm here today is that uh, we we want to share our findings, and if people have things that they've been doing, we want to learn more and try to implement them into our system. Um, you'll see uh, there uh, in the uh, lower left hand corner, uh, there's a video, and that's uh, we've archived our our long table discussions, uh, they're on our uh, Facebook Live page, uh, and they're also on our YouTube page, so that people can see our conversations. Uh, and then, um, you know, spotlight the festival footprint year round. Uh, one of the, I think, greatest things that's come out of this is, uh, as far as like making this a year round effort instead of uh, just focus, focusing on June, is that the uh, the city of Ann Arbor uh, was doing preparations. Uh, for a, a big Earth Day celebration uh, in downtown Ann Arbor. And uh, they had a, a big idea and uh, they wanted to put some artistic programming around it. Uh, and so because we had been working with them uh, and they had sponsored us uh, to have the Learning Center for this coming year, um, that was part of our growth was that the, the Learning Center was sponsored by this, or not sponsored by, we received a grant from the city uh, that the, um, City came to us and said, "Hey, can you help us do the programming, the, the artistic programming and the logistical programming for um, our festival footprint? Oh, sorry, for the um, Earth Day celebration that's happening. Unfortunately, the Earth Day celebration has been postponed uh, due to all of the things that are in the, happening right now in our environment. Uh, so uh, we plan as soon as things get lifted and uh, we start to get back to normal." to do this event with them, the Earth Day event, and uh, we think this is a really great opportunity uh, to continue our spotlight on the festival footprint. So um, that, that's pretty much uh, what I had to share with you all today. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about the Festival Footprint Initiative, you can go to a2sf.org, uh, Festival Footprint. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in emailing me, um, that's my email, carter at a2sf.org. Thanks, James. Impressive numbers after only two years, and sounds like this year is going to be even more exciting. Um, I'll remind our audience that you can type in your questions with the GoToWebinar toolbar, and um, we'll be taking those until about one o'clock, or until no one has any more questions. Um, and then um, also, if you missed it at the beginning, you can download the slides in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. So I will dive right in. The first question is, um, I'm currently a junior and I'm studying civil and environmental engineering at um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. 
This festival and the goals you attain are things I want to be involved with. Where can I start to become more aware of organizations that are doing this in my community and how can I make it a full-time career? Is that a better question for you, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't, I, I don't, mean, yeah. I don't mean to throw that back onto you, but I think that you probably have resources, especially in Illinois, that I don't have. Um, uh, yeah. I would say that there are definitely uh, organizations out there. I, I will say, from a festival uh, organizing point of view, this is a pretty new thing, uh, and uh, th there are all, uh, a lot of uh, organizations that are are eager to hear what we're doing because it's um, a, a new uh, aspect of how to run things and from what I've heard um, there are other big festivals or big events that are doing these types of things and it varies on to whether or not it's um, a lip service type of action or if it's really ingrained and I think that what we're trying to do is something really deep um, and uh, part of our DNA so that you know after three or four years of doing this this is just how we do business and um, and uh, so I, I guess that that's that's my short um, answer. Beth, do you have some resources though? Um, yeah. Um, to be put on the spot, I can't think of anything like right now. But I know that sure. like um, we do have a, a Boneyard Creek um, Arts Festival, and I think they try to do um, zero waste. And I know they have a cleanup in in the spring. So. That's what I got right now, but um, if that person wants to email me, um, I definitely know a lot of people in the zero waste realm and can put you into contact with those people. And I would say that the, the Waste 360 article also gives a, a little bit more of an interesting um, perspective on it. There's one group out of Ohio um, that is very sort of grassroots, um, but they, they go around to festivals and they um, they actually they literally sort their job is to sort the the compost right and they have a whole process that they go through it um we're obviously implementing our process uh, for our festival that works with the way um, our operations uh, are, are um, situated okay the next question is the current pandemic means many summer festivals museums and other art related outreach projects have been canceled this summer Many of these programs will suffer from reduced income because such cancellations. Do you think programming for zero waste efforts for the next year post pandemic events makes sense for such programs as a way to reduce costs for future events? Do, sorry, the, repeat the last part about that. Do I think that zero waste programming for zero waste? Can you repeat that part? Yeah. Um, the, Full question is, do you think planning for zero waste effect, sorry, do you think planning for zero waste efforts for the next year slash post pandemic events makes sense for such programs as a way to reduce costs for those future events? To reduce costs for those future events. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know if this is exactly the right, the, the answer that you're looking for. Uh, I would say that um, right now what we're trying to do is, um, you know, make change and transform things for another pot potential catastrophe that's coming down the road. <laughs> and um, if anything, I feel like that this um, time is uh, showing us that uh, any time something can come up. Um, I don't know that um, that implementing the zero waste uh, would be about reducing costs necessarily. Uh, I do feel like as with most things that are in uh, this sphere, when you are trying to do things to begin with, uh, it can be challenging uh, and uh, expensive. Um, but one of the things that we found, again, this might not be answering your question exactly, but it goes to sort of offsetting costs. Uh, we uh, rose, we raised the price of our bottled waters in uh, 2019. And we raised it relatively significantly. Um, I guess you could call it a green tax, if you will, but we didn't put it out there as such, and we didn't let everyone know that we were raising our prices. We just did it. Uh, and then we added these water uh, stations, 
And between that and the support that we got from the university uh, and the county, and then of course Toyota, um, we were able to offset those costs. I don't know what the uh, landscape is gonna look like over the next two years uh, with regards to um, funding for these things, but I can only imagine uh, that if you're looking to do these uh, types of events through this year, uh, you're probably going to still be in the cycle where people, where uh, state, uh, county, and, and local governments are, are uh, their, their budgets are still there. Um, the budget, or the impact of, I think, uh, of a question in 2021. Uh, at least that's how I, I'm imagining it uh, from every, everything that I've been talking about. Okay, the next question is, sorry if I missed it, but could you talk about your uh, efforts to reduce and recover wasted food and uh, recipient community partners? So meaning vendors, caterers, and hospitality side. Yeah, it's a good question and something that we haven't really tackled yet, honestly. Um, we have some local, um, uh, we have some local uh, groups. Uh, there's a group called Food Gatherers and Food Gatherers actually came through and was in our uh, learning center this last year. And uh, it's a really wonderful organization uh, that uh, takes food from uh, restaurants and, and grocery stores here uh, that, that are being, uh, you know, take are not being used and uh, giving those to people in need. And uh, so we were really happy to support that. Um, as far as our food vendors go, um, the uh, currently, the, the way, and historically, the way that it's been going is that if there's food left over from our caterers and our, our food vendors, uh, we use it to uh, feed our employees at the end of the night. Um, they work very long, hard hours, and they don't typically get really big meals uh, during the evening. So none of the food goes to waste, uh, and uh, we're, we, we know that the, the food could potentially go elsewhere, um, but that is the current way that we deal with our, our on-site food waste. Uh, our, our food vendors have been generous in that, and our caterers uh, or parties uh, have been uh, happy to let those things um, stay behind. So um, what, one is a support of an organization that does that countywide uh, to people in need, and then the other one is supporting uh, our hourly workers. Next question. Are you considering any remote zero waste outreach education for ticket holders during this summer in lieu of in-person events? Um, that's a good question. I, I feel like uh, the, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is I don't know what that looks like yet. Um, we are in the midst of um, doing a, a maybe what I would call a grand pivot. Uh, we announced, uh, I think two Fridays ago now, uh, that we were canceling all of our indoor ticketed shows for June and July. Um, and we're in the midst of uh, making our plans for the outdoor portion of our festival. Uh, and as we've discussed it, uh, there have been lots of different uh, considerations. We, we, uh, so I, I can't announce anything at this stage of the game, but I can say um, that it's certainly a, a big part of what we're uh, imagining going forward, uh, whether it's educational uh, aspects of the learning center that we might be able to share with people, um, or whether it is, uh, um, you know, literally, you know, finding ways to, you know, uh, replicate the the three stream waste process. Uh, I, I will say, I'll go back to sort of what uh, I mentioned earlier around the city doing the zero waste, sorry, during the um, Earth Day event, uh, and that the Earth Day event, uh, once that happens and comes off the ground, I have a feeling that that's gonna be a really large presence uh, for, uh, for our off season uh, festival footprint presence. Okay, next question is, do you have food trucks at your event and how do you work with them to change their materials uh, monetary incentives, uh, discussions, verbal praise, et cetera. <laughs> uh, th that's really, 
an important part of uh, this process. You know, uh, when we announced that we were going to do this, um, well, we announced that we were going to do it in 2018, but when we really got down and dirty with our uh, food vendors, um, all of them were, were receptive um, to varying degrees, but mostly, you know, we're on board. Uh, and um, I guess there wasn't really much incentive. Um, one thing that we didn't do was last year, we did not increase their food vendor uh, fee. Each one of our food vendors pays a fee to the festival and we uh, did not increase that uh, number last year. We knew that there would be uh, potentially added costs um, with regards to um, the uh, compostable items that they needed to purchase. Um, and we um, also uh, didn't do this in season, but we're going to do this the next time. And that is, um, there are websites that you can go on that uh, you can take uh, SKUs from products like a cup product or a plate product or a uh, fork product and um, type in the SKU and see if it's BPI compliant. And so what our plans this next time are to um, have all of our food vendors uh, send us the, the SKUs. Um, but we'll, before we do that, we'll tell them, hey, this is the website. You can check all your stuff on this website. And then they're, they're going to have to send us the SKUs and we're going to check them and make sure that it's uh, double checked. Uh, and if anything is not compliant, we're going to go back to them and say, can you please um, consider changing this? Uh, and it's in their contract. And so um, I know that that's like not incentive, but um, if they don't want to do it, um, they don't have to be part of the festival. We definitely have other food vendors who are interested in um, being a part of our festival. Um, most of the vendors that we work with uh, have been doing it for years and we, we love working with them and we have good relationships with them. And it's a, you know, a smallish town of about 130,000 people. And so um, it's, you know, uh, kind of everybody knows everybody here. Um, and so it, it shifts. Uh, I will say also that our food vendors um, have booths. They're not uh, food trucks, um, but we have been transitioning that a little bit and we have a couple of food trucks now. So just sort of for context um, between, between uh, or just how we're set up, I guess, for context. Okay, we had a comment come in. Um, they just wanted to say that this was a great webinar, webinar and um, it, it gave a lot of great insight and they learned a lot, so thank you. Oh, thank you. And then the next question is, how willing are vendors to switch over to compostable materials? Typically, they'd lose money by not giving the cheap disposable route, which is probably why most don't automatically do that. Sure, I, I sort of answered the question a second ago, but I, I, the other thing I didn't, the anecdote I didn't really share earlier that I, I was sort of touched by um, was, I mentioned about halfway through the season, we went to all of the food vendors and said, here's where you're doing well, here's where you're not doing so well. Is there a chance that you can shore up these, these parts? And we had, had one vendor that was using a specific kind of cup. Uh, and the cup uh, was, according to their research, uh, uh, compliant, uh, compostable. And then when we researched it on our end, we, you know, with this website that you can um, have, uh, and I, I can, I, I don't know, Beth, if you have that resource. If not, I can send it to you. And if anybody's interested in it, um, we, we can uh, share it after the fact. But um, the, the point being is uh, they were really like disappointed that they hadn't done well. <laughs> it was very sweet. Um, and they said, uh, well, I, we had got on the phone and had a really great conversation about it because you know, email sometimes is, is tough. And uh, at the end of the conversation, uh, the vendor said to me, you know, I just wanted to tell you uh, that we've found, we, we appreciate this so much and it was so successful for us. Uh, we realized that the, it's not going to be that much more money for us to do it. Um, we're making a change in our brick and mortar store. And uh, so that was one of the most exciting moments for me of this, this uh, operational change was that uh, one of our food vendors actually is going to change. And so upstream, we're making a, a big difference, and then of course downstream too. Um, and and so I I feel we're fortunate here in Ann Arbor because there's a lot of uh, 
restaurants and coffee shops and places like that who are already using compostable cups. And so the language of it uh, isn't too foreign. I know that there are certain areas of the country in which it's probably going to be a lot more challenging and, and friction to try and get through. Um, you know, I would say that the, you know, you could incentivize um, by giving a discount to your vendor, um, your vendor fee. Um, but the other aspect of it is, if you don't want to do business uh, the way that we do business, then we'll find somebody else to take your spot, and that's that's incentivizing, <laughs> um, especially if uh, you're a 21 day festival and uh, small businesses rely on that. So um, I I don't like to put it in the position of being you know, the tough guy, but uh, I, I think that, you know, that's how you make change, make a difference is that you say, these are our values. And if you want to be a part of what we're doing, you need to comply to our values. Okay. Next question is, I'm helping organize a zero waste event, but I did not know that a 90% landfill diversion rate would be considered zero waste. Is this universally accepted, assumed? So I, yeah, I, I think that the um, there is no real um, there, there's no official stamp of approval. Uh, I think it's an unspoken uh, level at which you um, we all, we all recognize there will be landfill. There there is going to be waste that is not um, compostable or, or or recyclable. I mean, just for basic uh, you know things that we will not be able to change in the very near future. Um, is uh, we have porta potties outside, and those porta potties are a certain amount of waste. <laughs> um, and uh, we build things uh, on our uh, site and have uh, waste from uh, from those types of things. We have uh, vinyl um, signage, and right now there's no good alternative uh, for all weather uh, outdoor uh, signage. Uh, part of it is. Um, that the materials exist, but then the ink is not biodegradable. And uh, there aren't any local vendors that are uh, doing uh, printing with biodegradable ink because it would require a completely new machine. And so th there are certain incremental things that we just, you, I think that people who are doing these types of events recognize we just cannot make those changes at this stage of the game. And so that 10% um, is that leeway. Um, again, there's no, industry standard or stamp of approval, but I think that that's what people um, suggest is that if you're at the 90%, you can call yourself zero waste. Okay. Um, do you clean the recyclables before they are sent to the recycling center? Um, we do not. Um, we do have uh, a team that goes through and sorts them and make sure that all the liquid is, uh, is dumped out and uh, that they're as clean as we possibly can get them. Um, we don't have the, the uh, resources at this stage of the game to do uh, like serious cleaning. And I think that that was part of the problem that we were having with one of our vendors is that they were, um, they were uh, doing like milkshakes or, or, or something like that. And um, they were like, well, yeah, these things are recyclable if there's nothing in them. And so um, most people don't know that we have to clean them out. And um, so it, it's successful to varying degrees and we're looking at ways to improve upon that going forward. Okay, I'll ask this final question as we're coming up on the hour mark. Um, is the summer festival interested in moving towards solar power? I think this goes to cost reduction question as net metering and solar power could theoretically cut costs. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't really have a lot of time to go into all the research that we've done around it. The short end of the story is that for a, a festival of our size and length, uh, it's very, very challenging. Uh, we are very fortunate, again, that the University of Michigan is here and that we are close to the engineering uh, department there, uh, and the, or the engineering school, rather. And uh, we've had some discussions around uh, sustainable energy and, and how we might be able to swap out our generators for that. Uh, in, in lieu of that, we have been looking into getting um, uh, credits um, for the, the um, because right now we're still using diesel generators uh, for full transparency. Uh, there's really not been a way to get around that. Uh, 
uh, and we are uh, looking to get um, uh, credits uh, for to, to put back onto the grid so that we can call it like a net zero um, uh, waste or not net zero energy on our uh, on our electricity. So uh, it, it's a it's a big question. Uh, there are other aspects to this that I won't get into, but um, it's certainly something that we have been looking into. Thank you for a great presentation. If we didn't get to your question or you have questions later, feel free to uh, email JD. His email information is on the screen right now. And with that, I will conclude this presentation. Thank you all for Thanks listening. So much. Have a good day.